There we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I apologize. I can't be there in person, but uh, as luck would have it, came down with a cold. And while I want to share a lot of things with all of you, germs is definitely not one of them. Uh, so I'm Lance Eaton. I'm here to talk to you uh, today and hope you find this session useful. Uh, a lot of the things I'll be talking about and the work that I've done in the last 15 years, uh, this is just like an extension in core in a part of it. So I've done a lot of work in education and technology, and also a lot of thinking about how the digital age changes the game for how we pursue jobs and build our professional identity. Uh, I've been doing workshops on building professional identity, particularly around professional digital identity using things like social media and other online tools. Uh, and I've been doing this kind of work for at least a decade. Uh, and well, you know, when ChatGPT came out, uh, I, that got me thinking about what does this tool mean for how we do all of that. So what you'll see today is a lot of how I've put that together and making sense of it today. And I should also note that like while I'm making sense of it today, the rate and the ways that things are changing, uh, I can't say I'll have the same thoughts tomorrow or maybe even an hour from now. So what are we gonna do today? Uh, I need to ground our talk in an acknowledgement about the concerns of generative AI. Then I'm going to be asking some questions about generative AI to get a sense of where folks are at. I may have to adjust that because of the, the format here, but I want to give us a grounds for what we're talking about when we talk about generative AI. Uh, along those lines, we're going to do a little myth busting, kind of what AI is and what it isn't. And then we'll talk about the ways to use it in job search and then get into prompting. Uh, and then we'll end with some final consideration about using these tools as a professional. And of course, questions, which is always you know the really fun part. I shouldn't say that's the really fun part, but it's the, the most interactive part um, in this environment. So uh, let's see, things to consider. All the slides in the notes, uh, the materials are covered with a Creative Commons license. And so you see that link at the bottom of this slide, that link will be on most of the slides. That will give you access to what I call the annotated slides, which is a Google Doc that will have the text of each slide along with various resources for that slide or prompts to try or results that I've gotten from playing with generative AI. Um, those are yours to access, yours to share. They're all covered with a Creative Commons share alike license, which means you can use them in other spaces, but you have to also give them Creative Commons license. So by all means, make use of, enjoy, they're there for your use. So this presentation was prepared using generative AI tools. Uh, I acknowledge that many generative AI, uh, much of generative AI does not respect the individual rights of authors and artists and ignore concerns over copyright and intellectual property in the training of the system. Additionally, I acknowledge that many AI systems are trained in part through exploitation of precarious workers in the global south. Also, I recognize that the structures to support the expanse of AI rests on continued large scale extraction of resources from environments and methods that have long effects on the local populations. And in the end, many of those resources, such as hardware, are often causing further harm in global climate change and environmental degradation, particularly and directly for the global south and communities that are historically and presently marginalized. In this work, I specifically used generative AI as a collaborative exercise and to test out some of the ideas about its usage, better understand the tool, and may also demonstrate some of the ways it generates answers. So I'm curious, and even though I can't see, it would be useful for the room. Uh, I'm going to go through this list of tools that are probably the most popular generative AI tools, and I'm curious who may have heard of them. So maybe raise your hands if you have heard of ChatGPT. I can't see it. There we go. All Everyone right. Has. I was going to say, I was like, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to assume a lot of people have. How about Claude? I think I see one or two, maybe. One percent. Okay. Bing? How about Bing? Three quarters, maybe. Okay. Bard? How about Bard? Three people. All right. Dolly? More than I thought, like 10. Cool. And mid journey. Like five. Okay. Five. All right. That's good. There's a good mix in there. And of course, you know, there's at this point, uh, there's 10,000 or more generative AI tools out there. Uh, but these are the ones that have been with us probably the longest and have the most. Uh, 
the most use and the most familiarity. So Claude and ChatGPT are text-based AI chatbots that you can converse back and forth with. You're basically chatting with the AI in a chat box that we're all very familiar with, whether from texting or uh, you know, being online in, in uh, different conversations and stuff. Bard and Bing are from Microsoft and Google respectively. And they can be chatbots, but they are also increasingly integrated into search or uh, Microsoft and Google's other tools. So you might be using, say, Google Docs, and now there's an AI feature in that. Um, I used Google Slides for this presentation, and there's an AI feature in Google Slides that has me or allows me to generate images based on a description. Bard will generate an image based on a description that I give it. They're not always great, but this is an iterative process. And then Dolly and Midjourney are AI image generators where you put in that description and they generate an image based upon that description. And so these are a couple of the tools out there, but there's other tools around video, around audio, uh, around websites, like there's a wide range. Um, and I encourage you to think about where, where your work is going to be and go and start to look at some of those tools. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm actually going to focus almost largely on ChatGPT, uh, but I have included in that annotated slide deck resources to go and explore other tools. So what is generative AI? Um, I, a lot of folks have lots of different thoughts about this. And so I did what many people who have been playing with AI have done, is I went and I asked ChatGPT, Claude, Bing, and Bard. And they all gave, they all gave varying and useful answers. And they were actually pretty similar. Uh, but then I took each AI's answer and I poured them all into Claude and said, take these four definitions of generative AI and come up with the cleanest, clearest, and simplest explanation of generative AI, of generative AI that is under 50 words and can be understood by an eighth grader and maintains the full integrity of what generative AI is. And so it came up with this definition. Uh, generative AI is a type of AI that can, be, that can create new content like text, images, and videos after learning from large amounts of data. Now that's great, that's simple. And at the same time I read that and I'm like, okay, but that doesn't like, if I give that to somebody, it's, it's not fully clear what that fully means. So I went back to Claude and I asked it to elaborate, right? So this is me interacting with a generative AI tool in a text box. So I gave it the definitions from the different tools. I said, hey, put these together in a simple definition. And I said, actually make it a little bit, uh, make it more elaborate, uh, elaborate a little further. And so this is the definition that it came up with. Generative AI refers to artificial intelligence systems that can generate new original content, such as text, images, audios, and video. These AIs are trained on large data sets, which allows them to learn patterns and relationships in data. They can use what they have uh, learned to produce new examples that are similar, but not entirely the same as the training data. And so that's a, that's a pretty good definition. I mean, for me, I would probably play around two or three more times to get something that I feel like both explains the depthness of it and you know my rule of thumb for trying to see if uh if non-technical people can understand it is i'm apt to go to my mom who is wonderful and smart and brilliant in many many different ways but technology isn't always like where her mind goes and so if she can understand that description i know that it's a good description to explain what ai is all right so that's that's what it is. Um, it still feels a little vague, right? It still feels a little like, okay, I think I think I understand. Like generative AI makes stuff. Uh, it makes text. It makes audio. It makes images. These are things that we use and uh, that we will then use in other spaces. And we certainly, in this talk, will kind of look at where and how you're going to use that. You might use them. But let's play a little true and false. So. General, a generative artificial intelligence may be coming sentient. Show of hands who feel that's true. Show oh. of, What was that? No one. No one. All right. Show of hands who, who thinks that's false. And then a bunch of people are like, I'm sitting on the fence. That's fine. I get it. We're not quite sure. Right? 
And it's by and large false. Um, it's not a person or sentient. Uh, no matter what all those sci-fi novels and movies and TV shows and comic books and Silicon Valley dude bros tell us, it's not sentient. We have a long history of telling ourselves that our objects are real going back for millennia, right? We have story after story where we decide that the object is real. Um, and that gets amplified, of course, when we hear and see in the media these, you know, what are often sound bites and misrepresentations of what generative AI is. So maybe, maybe somewhere in the future, uh, sentience will emerge from machines. Like, sure, I'm not saying that's impossible, um, but really right now in this moment, any story you hear that's telling you, you know, it's real or it's becoming sentient is largely just, you know, it's just something to increase the clicks. Uh, it, it, just to pause to give you the, the definition, if you guys don't know exactly what that means, it means like perceive or feel. Okay. Say that. Keep going. I'm sorry, what was that? I missed it. I was just giving, I was just giving them the, the definition ah. if they weren't sure exactly what that means. Got it. All right, so another true or false generative AI uh, thinks to arrive at its answers like humans do. How many folks feel that's true? How true? many? Okay. Yeah, a couple of truths. Okay. Yeah, two, two truths. All right, that's cool. How many feel it's the false? Most feel it's most of them. Okay. All right, so we're getting on the right track here. We're, one of the things to understand is that AI doesn't think like you or I do. And as we're using this tool, because of the way it, its language and its interaction, it's very easy to make those assumptions to feel like it has human uh, qualities, like it uses things like please and certainly and like uses these, this language in a way that makes it feel a little more lively than we might think otherwise. Um, but I think, first of all, you know, generative AI doesn't think like you or I do, uh, in part because we all think differently. That's, that's the cornerstone of neurodiversity. Um, but it's also our minds are composed of often whole things, be it words or images or sounds and tastes. By contrast, generative AI works through the only term I can give you is mathing the hell out of things. Like that's how generative AI quote unquote thinks. So what does that mean? So for instance, when generative AI is working with a text, a generative AI will first have access to what is called a large language model. This is a massive amount of data uh, of, of text. And what the generative AI does is it goes into that data set and it mathematically analyzes the relationships across all the text. Now, it doesn't analyze the words, right? It's not looking at one word versus another and how they fit together, but rather it it analyzes strings of text. Those strings of characters are referred to as tokens and are short, they're usually short, somewhere around four to five characters long. So if you're looking at the word like giraffe, a token is only gonna be like G-I-R-A. It's only gonna be like a four letter part of that. And so the AI calculates the relationship and probabilities of those tokens across that data set and also with any prompt you give it. So when ChatGPT goes or gets a prompt by a user, it's mathematically examining the relationship among the tokens and then searching its large language database for similar, for, for similar relationships to help calculate the most probable answer. And that's a key piece to remember is it's not answering you directly. It's just, prob like it's, it's just looking at the probabilities of if you put forward this formula of tokens, then the probable solution is this set of tokens. So it's not thinking, it's mathing. All right, I think this is the last one. Uh, generative artificial intelligence can lie. How many people think that's true? Uh, I'm seeing some hands. How many people think it's false? No. All right, so it's technically false, right? This is a tricky one um, because it is true that generative AI doesn't lie. Lying comes with intention and intention is human. Can it give false information? Yes, 
But when you hear language, when you hear la language about it lying or hallucinating, it's important to understand that it's assigned that we're assigning human characteristics to it uh, that confuse our use of it. It it will present false information because it's not thinking or rationalizing or proving things in the ways that we humans do. It's mathing the relationships, and that may lead it to come up with poorly calculated wording. And so while it doesn't lie to you, you certainly shouldn't trust it, right? And so that's the thing to remember is, is you know, when we use that language of lying, we're starting to think more of it as a human versus a tool. And that's, I think, an important piece we often get confused around generative AI in the discussion. And it's noted, like, it's, it's worth noting that, like, the group as a whole, that was the, that was the one that folks were like, uh, I'm not sure. All right. Here's another fun one. Generative AI will take all of our jobs. Who's who feels that's true? Who's here getting ready for the Terminator? It's okay. I don't blame anybody if you're feeling that way. Wait. All right. Who believes? Who believes it's false? Most most of us. All right. All right. All right. Good. We're in the right spot, right? Like especially if we're here to learn about how we can use it in our work. We want to really hope that the, you know we're all thinking about uh, it not replacing our work. So for the foreseeable future, a generative AI replacing our jobs is highly unlikely. It will definitely disrupt and augment a lot of different types of work. And part of the challenge for all of us is to stay abreast of, uh, of it to understand how it impacts our individual industries and jobs. Any knowledge worker is going to have to consider and contend with how these tools can amplify their work, but not necessarily replace it at this moment. At its core, it's likely to help us do a lot of things we didn't do before, and that can create new opportunities. Um, there is going to be jobs that are lost or jobs that no longer are valid. Um, that's a, that happens with every technology, um, but there's always like there is a long history of new technologies emerging, replacing a lot of old jobs and creating a lot of new jobs. I'm not trying to be blindly optimistic. But that is a pattern we have seen time and again, and we've seen how that impacts a lot of people's experience um, and actual up, um, upward mobility. So we can look at from the industrial age onward, we do see lar a much larger mass of people moving from impoverished conditions because there are more dynamic and complex jobs around than agrarian farming. All right, so now is the question of Kind of that's the framework now let's get into how might you use it in in your job search um, there's a lot of options here to explore and i won't go into all of them in this session but the resource will have different prompts and ideas for you to try out but there's really big three big ways to think about how you can use generative ai in your work uh, in, in in preparing or getting internships jobs etc the first is unpacking your own abilities and skills Right? How do you best understand what it is that you bring to the table? Because for many of us, it's hard for us to know. Anticipating the needs and expectations of your work. So what is it in the field that is going to be expected or needed or will give you an edge? And then finally, bridging your work, right? Bridging you to the work. That is, once you unpack those abilities and skills, how do you then connect them to the work that you want to be doing? And so for examples of different things ChatGPT or other generative AIs can help with, there's a long list here. Again, not gonna go through them. That's what the slide deck is for to, to follow up on. But it's things like developing your skills inventory, developing a target list, enhancing your digital uh, professional profiles. So improving your LinkedIn, whether it's your description, whether it's your title, whether it is how you describe the work that you're doing, your keywords, all of that. Working with cover letters, doing interview prep, uh, I've seen a few people now use it for employment offer negotiations, like they use it as a way to start to figure out strategy to get more out of what they are uh, of the job that they've been offered. So let's actually take a look at some of these prompts. Not going to read all the text on the screen. It's there again, just as an example. Um, so when it comes to jobs, it can be hard for many of us to talk about ourselves and highlight our strengths and our abilities. Uh, sometimes it's it's because we just don't know them or realize them, right? So often folks will say to say something to me along the lines of like, wow, I do something so good. How do I do that? And like, I'm struck by the question because I'm not always sure, 
right? I'm sure other folks have had this where it's like, I just do it. And usually within that question is a sense that I've done something that they struggle with. And for me, it's just something that I may not have to struggle with. So it feels out of the ordinary. And that's the thing, like that, that's sometimes the hard thing about our skills. If we don't name them or reflect on them, it can be hard to call upon them when asked or needing to explain them. And this is where generative AI comes in really handy. You can use it to better explain things that you may not have realized you were doing. For instance, asking it to draw out skills in something you may have done. So maybe you run a club on campus. Provide a description of what you do. Particularly important uh, for these types of things is to solicit the generative AI to ask you more questions. And this is one of the cool things about generative AI is like it doesn't get bored. It doesn't like not want to respond. It will continue to respond so long as you continue to engage with it. So you can actually flip the script and have it interview you to, to help understand yourself. So while we, you know, we think we know what is important, that's not always the case. So by providing more information to ChatGPT or whatever tool you're using and having them ask more questions, you can kind of get a much more robust sense of what you have to offer. So in the case of this one, I talked about, you know, when I was in college and I ran the historical association, you know, and I'm saying like, well, what are the skills I got out of this? And I gave it a particular set of ways to respond. And so here are some of what it gave me back. The, the full list you can see in the, the, the annotated slides, but like, oh, well, if I, these are the things that I did. I did event planning and coordination. I did budget, budget management. I did stakeholder communication, advocacy and negotiation. It's a really nice way of like helping me to understand both how it was now demonstrated and why it's an important value as a professional. So if nothing else, this becomes that like you can continue to ask, you can continue to come up with examples, it can continue to help you understand and draw out these connections that I know for myself, like I had to do that. I had to figure that out like over the long, over the long arc of my career. It wasn't something that I could just do uh, right out of college. So another thing, and, uh, and Kate talked with me a bit about this, is you know, developing your target list. Um, and so in this example, you know, I'm asking ChatGPT to help me build out a plan for my target list. Uh, and then through dialogue, I can come up with both the steps and the industries to further explore. So for this one, it's, you know, you are a job, I tell it it's a job and internship planning expert. And I ask it to advise a student to come up with their target list that is relevant, achievable, and not too many places. Uh, I tell ChatGPT that its output should be in a table form and include the step, the estimation, the estimated duration of time um, to achieve the step, the reason for the step, an example of what the step would look like. In those examples, I ask it to draw from different industries. So I have different examples to, to look at. And so here's what it starts to build. Right? Again, it gave me a lot more than this, and you can see what it does in the in the slide deck, but like it walks me through. Here's how much each of these should take. Here's how long, here's a step, how long it should take, uh, reasons for the step, like why is this important to do? And then examples in different, what it would look like in different industry, different industries. So again, this is a, in what I'm doing right now is a very generic, a very generalized approach. But what's valuable is you can put your own context in there. You can say, I'm looking within this specific industry, help me build my target list and let's go from there. So in addition to developing that skill inventory, it can be helpful to think about how those skills line up and can be utilized in the field that you're interested in. Uh, this, is, this is helpful both to like make sure you have the right skills and in thinking about how those skills might be used in that field. Sometimes it's the development of a skill you might find that, uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes in the development of a skill, you might find that work less exciting. And so here again, I try to identify what is it that I've done and how does that prepare me for the next thing? So I, this is a particular, this is my personal example. So just to give you a sense of like, oh, like in the late 2000s, I was doing a lot of teaching and somehow made the move into instructional design. Um, these are the things that it provided me with in terms of like, oh, these are the skills by doing all of that teaching that prepare you for instructional design. Uh, subject matter expertise, adaptability and flexibility, mentoring and onboarding, technical proficiency. And so again, at the time, I probably was able to identify some of these things, but like the list, as you'll see in the resources, it's like 10, it's at least 10 different skills. And I'm like, wow, I could have made a much better case. And maybe I could have used that much better case to also get better pay. Um, not saying I didn't get paid, like, 
I'll take a step back and not, that's not an implication I didn't get uh, reasonable pay, but just as an example of why and how that might help you as you move forward in, uh, in the job search. There's also interviewing prep, right? So once you have that interview, how you're gonna like how you're going to prepare for it. And so this is a prompt that I used where it was, you know, act as a expert in job interviewing in instructional design and higher education and provide a list of 20 distinct, uh, distinct and significant questions that might come up in the interview. Rate each question on a scale of 10 of its likeliness to be asked, with one being not likely and 10 being definitely going definitely not uh, Sorry, 10 being definitely going to be asked. For each question, provide an explanation of why that question would be asked and what might be two or three points to highlight in one, one's answer, right? So again, these may not be the actual questions I get asked, but if I produce this list and I prepare for this list, I'm gonna be prepared for a lot of other similar questions. So once again, it gives me that list. I asked it to put in a table format, boom, it's very perfectly clear, and now I can prepare for that interview. I'm going to just take a sip here. So Will you that for a second, Lance? Sure. What was that? You go back one slide. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, I messed it up. What I love about this all is like the likelihood of it getting like asked. Mm -hmm. Like that's like one of the more amazing things I find. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's a thing I encourage, like I would say, always be thinking about is what is the way you can help it rate what it's giving you? Um, and so a lot of times I will ask, I will ask the question and then I will ask like, oh, what's your certainty or how valuable is this on a 10 scale? And there's a couple other examples where I show that. And again, always be thinking about when you ask that prompt, you can put in what you want. So it's not just I want the answer, but how how valuable is this or how important is this or you know, rate the skills that I need or like rate the value, of, the value of each skill that I need for a particular job. Okay, so because I am obviously a professional, my pets make it into my slides, so you'll have to bear with me on that. Um, but let's play a little game of good prompt, bad prompt. Uh, write a cover letter for me. I'm applying to be an engineer at Google. Raise your hands if this is a good prompt. Good prompt, bad prompt. Is this a good prompt? No. We get a very, very strong no. Um, and that's correct. It is not a, a good prompt. Um, what makes it a bad prompt? I think primarily there's no relevant details, right? So this is an important thing about using ChatGPT is like that old model of just like Google, like garbage in, garbage out. If you do not give specificity, if you do not leverage the ways to communicate and give it context, like, you're going to get something that is very, very mediocre and is not going to help you. And in fact, is probably going to be seen and assumed to be generative AI, which will probably just end up having you at the bottom of the pile, if not, not in the pile at all. What about this one? Write me a LinkedIn summary that makes me sound amazing so that everybody will want to hire me. Good prompt. Any takers? No, no takers. Nope. Yeah. No, no. No, and, and it's not right. So this is a this is an important piece and why I also have that those resources is for you to really start to look at what are different types of prompts that can help you and to always remember to not take the prompt in its entirety, but think about how you customize it for yourself. Right. This this tells ChatGPT nothing. It tells you nothing that can help them make it, or help it make you sound more coherent or more effective and doesn't even know what you want to be hired for. So how is it going to like, how is it going to do anything besides generate a lot of generic stuff? Okay, so this is just kind of us getting primed to talk about prompting. Um, the thing about these tools is that, you know, they are only as good as what you give it. Uh, and in many ways, it's still quite helpful um, in moving you faster along, especially if you struggle with writing, uh, writing or trying to self promote uh, as is often needed in the job search. So these are helpful, but you really have to think about how you use them if you really want to leverage that help uh, and that support. So um, it is important to to maximize the tool by both a mixture of creative prompts um, that guide the AI in knowing more clearly what you are looking for. Uh, you should be very clear about its outputs so that it actually gives you what you want. Um, 
we are often not great at communication in general. Uh, my classic example of that is if you ever get a text from a friend, a loved one, a family member, and it says, it's fine, you have no clue how to read that. You have no clue how to read that. You're like, is it is it really fine? Or is this the like, it's fine, and I'm about to like rip your head off. So generative AI is the same way. Not that it's going to rip your head off, but it is going to need more context, more information. Um, it can't be clairvoyant. It needs to know where you want to take this. So things that make a good prompt is context and details, right? You have to provide it with a deeper sense of what you're trying to do. Uh, and you can do this by front loading piece, uh, uh, useful pieces of information. Uh, and so some of the prompts you saw before, like I provided it job descriptions, I explained what it is I wanted to do, or maybe something that I've done that I'm trying to move somewhere. That is really helpful. So it knows this is the domain that you are trying to operate. The act as tool, um, and it's, people use, use different language, uh, whether it's act as this or you are this, but giving it a specific role. So you probably saw in those previous prompts, like act as an expert job interviewer, right? What you're trying to do is prime ChatGPT for where it's going to look within its large language model, as opposed to just look across its large language model. So it really tries to fine tune and focus the AI model to draw upon differently ranked data and get better quality information. So think about that when you're going to ask it, is this an answer where specialty and expertise would be important? Then make sure you, you clear that, you, you clarify that. Frame the response. So it's really useful to explain how you want the response. As you saw what I did, a lot of the responses I framed like put into a table. Um, in a cover letter, you might ask it for uh, to use, say, professional but lighthearted tone, or you might, you know, do as I did, which is um, give it a certain, you know, a certain way of, or you might give it the like the four or five things that are really needed in that output. So just be thinking about, you know, not just I want this, but what should it look like? I like to tell to make tables because as you can see, it makes it very clear and clean and I can kind of move through it fairly quickly. I mentioned this already, but getting it to ask you questions. Uh, some of the prompts asked that, that, that I just shared show that, right? Getting the AI to interview you and figure out, uh, figure out what it needs, that is going to be really helpful because sometimes you just don't know what questions to ask. And by having it, by flipping that script, having the AI interview you, it can really get you quicker down. Like it can be a really great starting point to figure out what exactly you're looking for. And then it's also important to iterate on past prompts. So uh, it's, it's important to realize that the power of this tool or one of the big powers of this tool is that it's a chat bot. Think about like in your cell phone when when you're in your text messages, right? If you are texting John, like you have the entire text history with John and that's context. Like you can always scroll back up and be like, wait, what did John say that day? Okay, and you can use that as part of the conversation. But if you're on another text chat with Maria, Maria doesn't know anything about John, right? Maria is not accessing that, that actual chat. ChatGPT and many of these tools work the same way is that you set, up, you set up threads of conversation. And if you're in one thread and you're talking about, like in my case, instructional design, but then I go and start another thread that's talking about, I don't know, gardening. I've used it to help me figure out my garden plans. Um, those two threads aren't communicating back and forth. It's only, I can talk, like, I can inform one thread of, with new prompts about information around gardening, but they by and large are going to be separate. So it's useful to know that. And it's also useful to know that anything in a given thread is further informing the new information that it generates. So think of it always as in conversation in that thread. And it can be really helpful as you like both give it information and get information. And then finally, collect examples that you find useful. Um, you're lucky here because, uh, you know, right off the bat, you have a bunch of prompts within the resources that are going to hopefully be helpful and guide you. Um, but really take a look out and see what other people are doing. I see I, I see and find some of my best prompts through things like TikTok and uh, Twitter and the like. And there's really good places you can start to see how other people are using it and just adapt those prompts for your own usage. And then a couple things to think about in terms of using this, uh, some professional considerations um, that you really want to think in mind about, about how you use this. 
Um, so we've done this brief tour of generative AI and what it can do. Um, and it's time to just do a little bit more acknowledging of some things to be thinking about. The privacy of these tools leaves much to be desired. It remains unclear with some tools exactly how much of what you put into it is held by them for both training of data and later reuse in some way. Though that is, though that is like that way is like more likely to be mathematical in the you know in the sense of not reproducing your words word for word, but more like the probabilistic relationships that I had mentioned before. It does raise concerns about privacy. Uh, there's been several different instances. I want to say it was Amazon and maybe maybe Wells Fargo. It was a financial company. Both had to ban the use of ChatGPT because people were using formulas. Uh, that like exclusive coveted, you know, exclusive formulas of their companies, putting it into ChatGPT to produce things. And then those formulas were showing up in different ways elsewhere. So this means you have to, you want to be care, like you want to be careful and thoughtful about your own privacy and what you put into it. Um, I'd be hesitant to put anything that is like my own writing or work that I want or that I, that I have any intention of showing up any elsewhere. It's a little different when I think about cover letters, but if I'm trying to, like, if I'm writing essays or things like that, I'm, I'm going to sometimes be hesitant about that. Um, and that's just me, but different people are going to have different thoughts. It's important to just figure out where your line is. Um, and along, along those lines, it's incredibly important to be careful with putting other people's information or work into these tools, uh, since there may be matters of privacy and copyright uh, violations there, right? So you never want to be putting other people's stuff into there without their permission. There's also the question of figuring out what is the appropriate level of help. Um, you're all adults and you have so many pressing things. Uh, it can be really easy to lean heavily on a tool such as this um, to, do a, to a, do a lot of the work um, to get a job. And there's some places within the process that it makes sense, but you don't want to want, wantonly accept and use the tool without thought and intention. You always want to be thinking about and reviewing its outputs to see if it genuinely reflects you, your work and your voice. Uh, because while this tool can be helpful in the process, uh, it can't replace you when you are interviewing or in the actual work. And any inconsistencies between who you are in the applying process and who shows up at the job is going to have downstream effects. So a few guiding a few guiding questions to consider with this. How does the AI, how does this AI output reflect me? Where does it not properly reflect who I am? How accurate is the content of this output? How can I verify or validate what it is saying? Would a friend or colleague read this, read this AI output uh, that I'm about to use, feel like it actually reflects the person that they know? And then what aspects within this process of securing a job do I need to be more fully in control and comfortable with? All right, so you really want to do that. Be mindful about how much you use it and how that's going to impact how you or who you are when you show up. And then finally, you know, there are deeper and serious questions that I don't have any answers for uh, and grapple with myself every time I talk about, write about, or use generative AI. Uh, what does it mean to use these tools that have problematic aspects to them? Um, I mean, we already do it every, with everything else, whether it's cars or use our phones. Like we know these technologies have, they, there are larger problems that they contribute to. Um, but still at the forefront of this technology, meaning generative AI, unlike many others, we're woefully aware of the problems it represents in its usage. From issues about abusing copyright and employing people in Global South to do content moderation for a few hours, a, a few hour, few dollars an hour, to climate impact of energy use, to, uh, to run generative AI, to the amount of drinking water used for each prompt. These are serious concerns. You, about using the tool and how it does and will hurt other humans living in this, in this on this planet. So as I said, there's no good answer here because history shows us that this doesn't really stop us from using these things or perpetuating that harm. Yet I would encourage each of you to really sit with, sit with that a bit and be curious about why you are or aren't okay with that. All right. I think that's all I have. I think we're just on time to hopefully have some questions from folks. Awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Who has used AI in the internship and job search yet? No one has. So why I'm so excited about this is 
because everyone should be. There's like less barriers than there are in other areas of, of work and writing that you do. If you're not doing it, you're going to be behind in what it is that you can do. That being said, I'm so glad that um, you touched on, like, is this me? Because I think my one fear is face is a cover letter. And they can come in and they're like, he, he she, they do not write like this, right? And so, like, making sure that matches, I think, is one of, you know, one of, was always kind of one of my, like, this is the thing that's going on in my head right now. And how do you, how do you um, match what's being put in? Hmm. I have a question. The more that you ask, AI things. Does it become more like, does it get your vibe more? Uh, that's an interesting question. Not, I think because of the, for me, the sporadicness of questions I ask, because I ask it lots of things in different domains or, you know, in demonstrations. Um, I try to come up with like weird and wacky things. I also, um, because I, because I've been using it or been having other folks uh, for instance, I was using it in a class I was teaching, and I was encouraging students to use it, but I wanted them to feel safe and be able to have, like, their privacy respected, that I allowed them access to use mine, that, like, it's all over the place. So I, it's hard for me to answer because, like, there's, like, probably at this point 10 different people that access that account um, and ask all sorts of different questions. So for me personally, no, but there is a newer feature uh, there's a newer feature that came out with ChatGPT where you can actually give it customized instructions that are just there for every single prompt. So it's in your settings and the idea is like once you put in like this is who I am and this is how I plan to use it, then it's going to gel a lot more with like its answers are going to be more in alignment of what you're looking for. And you don't have to with each new thread tell it what you want it to be. That's a good point. Um, Professor Wimmer was just saying that you could possibly put in a, a sample of your own work and ask it to use that style to mm -hmm. create that, create what is it, oh, the cover letter. And that, and that, and that Ab Absolutely. So. In, in fact, um, one example I've, I've seen is because Claude allows you to upload almost the like length of a book, you can upload something like 200 pages. Um, I've seen some people take Claude and upload like a document with all of their different types of writing, ask Claude to come up with a really well-defined writing style based on that, and then take that description and plug it into ChatGPT's custom instructions so that it does exactly as you're, you're saying and is, is, much more, uh, is much more reflective of that, that particular person. Claude, what a guy. All right, any questions about how you guys can, you all can use that? Now you all have to use it. Yeah. How do, how do you think AI can change the future? How, how do you think AI is going to change the future? Um, whew, such a loaded question. Um, and I am not a futurist nor play one on TV, but I think my most optimistic version of it is like we all end up, or many of us that are comfortable with it and it makes sense, end up with AI helpers who are better at cueing us or nudging us around the things that are, we feel are really important, but are really challenged by. Uh, I don't know about anybody else, but I am a stress eater. And if I had somebody that was more cued into my, like my personal, like my stress levels, whatever, and was noticing, like I'm reaching for the chips more and just being like, Hey, noticing you're feeling a little stress. Is everything okay? Like, that would be great. I would love a personal assistant like that. So to me, it's like ways that it could actually help us in the ways that are just really hard for humans, like no judgment of anybody. Like there's lots of things around habits and ways we want to be that are just hard. And I could see this being helpful with that. 
my worst case scenario is like these tools can and will make us more productive and in the history of the world it feels like every time we get tools that make us more productive it doesn't actually change how much work we do uh, in fact it often increases us or has us doing more work so the scenario i often think about is like well if it took you you know a if it took you three months to do a report and now with chat gpt and that producing that report is super stressful and challenging and blah 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 and now it just takes you a month i can imagine in five years from now then the expectation is you produce that report every month um and so the the like hyper productivity cycle that is derived from just the way capitalism exists today um that's probably my, my scariest version is it just makes us all have to work even more harder. Um, yeah, so those are my two versions. I don't, it's probably gonna end up somewhere in between or somewhere entirely different, but in my head, that's, those are the, the things that, that come to mind. Well, I hope this all made you think about the, what you can use with it. Cause I do think as I work with students, I especially see a lot of value in like, what is it, what, are, what, are, what even companies should I be looking at right now? And I want to look at the Boston area. And we can throw that in and it becomes, it has this like amazing list of 15 companies that we can start, right? So these are just these small prompts that I would start with. And I think that you'll really, um, you'll really, you'll really be impressed by, by any of these features. The chat GPT has been really valuable in the searches that I've been doing. Okay, there's no other questions. I will be here for questions. Um, but hopefully this has made you think and I really appreciate all of the communication support and all of the students for coming.